So welcome everyone to uh, our meeting with uh, Charlotte, uh, the Ein Charlotte, the International Association of Near-Death Studies. And I am Tamara Calder Richardson, the director. And today we have a near-death experiencer guest and, uh, and it's Peter Panagore. Did I say, Pan did I say that correctly? Panagore. Panagore. Panagore? Okay, good. I, I want to go Panagore because I just want to say it's, it's Italian, but it's Panagore. It's Greek. It's Greek. Is it Greek? Oh, okay, Panagore. Okay, great. So uh, we have Peter here, and I want to go a little over his bio first, just because he has such a prolific background with all the things that, he, that he's done. And I want you to see where he's come from and how he's evolved. So today, I mean, he's written several books. Uh, one of which is Heaven is Beautiful, and today's topic is How Dying Taught Me That Death is Just the Beginning. So I just want to read over his bio, and then we're going to get into uh, a little bit about his first NDE, how that evolved, how it, how it changed him, his books that unfolded and how they unfolded, and then I can get a second NDE, and how that happened and unfolded, and, and then, you know, where he is now, and thoughts about uh, you know, what he's working on in his project. So let me go ahead and read his bio. And so uh, Peter Panagore, he's a global audible bestselling author. And that is one of his books is Heaven is Beautiful, How Dying Taught Me That Death is Just the Beginning. He's an entrepreneur and ordained pastor, Reverend Peter Baldwin Panagore. And, and he's got this, what is the destination? M-D-I-V? Uh, Masters of Divinity. Oh, beautiful. Okay, thank you for, for uh, uh, correcting me on that, what that was. That's, that's beautiful. Uh, broadcast for 15 years for a daily two-minute spot on NBC TV stations with, uh, with a daily devotional. Uh, it's a brand that he did just before the morning weather. I'd like to hear about that. But that was, uh, that was uh, very unique with you. Storytelling communicator, public speaker, pastor, storyteller. Peter had 30 million views annually on TV based on the Nelson ratings and uncounted listeners on FM and AM across the Maine and New Hampshire area and also around the nation. Peter graduated from Yale where he completed his Masters of Divinity with a focus on the practices and writings in the classic Western mysticism. A two-time near-death experiencer, Peter first died in 1980 of hypothermia uh, with ice climbing and we're gonna have him go into that and then later in heart, the heart attack 2015. So I don't wanna go too much into it because he's gonna go into that. Um, we have here that, uh, let's see, then you can tell us about this, but it looks like in 2020, Heaven is Up to Be a Future, uh, Heaven is Beautiful, his book is up for a future film, so we'll talk about that too, so remember that. Peter's Best Main Seller, Two Minutes for God, Quick Fixes for the Spirit, published with Simon & Schuster as a daily inspirational with stories from among uh, 1700, from the 1700 he wrote uh, and broadcast each day. Peter's uh, third book is The Modern Mysticism and You. Is that published yet? No, and it's had a title change. It's called Knowing God. Ooh, I like it better. It's, it's making excellent progress. Oh, I like that. Okay, so we'll talk. These are the cool stuff we'll talk about later. And whatever you feel like you can, you know, talk about, you know, the film or, or what you'd like to do with the film. So in 1990 to 2003, Peter published uh, 150 sermons and dozens of prayers as a staff writer for how do you pronounce a homiletic? Homiletic. Homilet homiletics is the art of preaching. That's beautiful. Okay, homiletics. That's beautiful. Okay, um, and you have your a very unique style too. It's very soothing. A national leading workshop preparation journal for the pro uh, progressive clergy. Peter published his first story, "Former Enemies Once," in the NYT's bestseller, "Chicken Soup and the Veteran Soul." Stories to stir the pride and honor the courage of our veterans, and again, and stories from a soldier's heart for the patriotic soul. Over five million copies in print were sold. Uh, Peter has been featured in Fox and Friends, Coast to Coast, AM, Canada's The Drew Marshall Show, and recently by Buddha at the Gas Pump and Shaman Oaks. He speaks and does interviews all around the world, including pulpits to, to podcast. He, he has written blogs in the Huffington Post for a decade, and at a uh, devotee of a heart, uh, a heartful meditation, inner yoga, Peter has daily uh, pursued for 40 years. Uh, Dig your way back to love the I am the effable holy. Hmm. I, I, I like to hear about that too. That's this, that sounds fun. Uh, Peter is featured in life to afterlife near death experience currently st uh, streaming on Amazon prime. So check that out on Amazon prime. He's in episode four, right? Change going to be in episode five 
Oh, okay, good. Okay. Sorry, it's, uh, he's coming down. He's, co he's okay. coming all the way to Maine to shoot this thing uh, in about three weeks. Awesome. Okay. So let's see. Uh, gosh, I got to ask you stuff about your bio because it's just, it's kind of your bio is living. I love that. Okay. So uh, uh, Life to Afterlife, episode five. So that's. Because uh, uh, well, uh, a bunch of our friends are in uh, episode four Trisha Barker, yeah. uh, Ingrid. And uh, who else is there? Sure, not sure. Uh, my gosh, I'm blanking on her name. I should never mention names. That's the the rule. No, <laughs> no, it's okay. Yeah, she. I, I, uh, matter of fact, Trisha told me about that, so I wasn't sure how, who everybody was, but it's going to be good. So this will be this will be exciting. Okay, and then uh, and then also uh, Peter will tell you how to connect with him. And then we're going to be doing more later on my own show, The Seeking Heaven, The Near-Death Experience. So, and then, you know, we'll keep you posted on all this. Uh, ever since 2013, Peter's been sitting on the state's Maine's domestic homicide review panel. He served 18 years as a congressional community minister in the United Church of Christ and an island on the coast of Maine. And in 2003, in Booth Bay, Harbor Bay, where he lives with his wife, his children, and his grandchildren, which we were having a chat beforehand. And uh, he loves parades and uh, walking on stilts and parades. I saw that picture. I was like, how do you, that looks so difficult. And he races in sailboats, which uh, as you can tell, he's, uh, you know, you're so well-rounded. And what I, what I really like about you, Peter, is that um, you're eclectic. So I feel right at home with you. <laughs> Very <laughs> eclectic. Because, you know, people try, and I think that says a lot because people try to put people you know, in boxes. And, you know, I don't like being in a box or labeled. I mean, people are going to do it, but, you know, and uh, I don't think we should do it with other people. Cause I know I don't, I don't like how that feels. And I love how people it's uh, I love how you have described yourself that, that you were out of the box. You're out of the box. <laughs> there is no box. <laughs> there is no box. Forget the box. <laughs> there is no box. So you never saw a box. And uh, that you have created your own uh, persona to not, to not really have a particular label that people can identify with because uh, I think people have become lazy. So they just, um, oh, they label people, blah, blah, blah. But we are, you know, eternal spiritual beings and we're so much more. And uh, it looks like you have really, uh, you know, uh, push things with, you know, as far as in each area, before you get started on your area of experience, I do want to ask you a couple things on your bio, because I'm really curious. I mean, uh, there sure. was, um, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Let me see where it was. Um, okay. So curious, uh, the sermons and dozens of prayers for the writer, a national leading, uh, uh, worship thing. Tell us a little bit about what that is. Cause that's just like a snippet. What did you uh, do with that when you would do the 50 sermons and prayers? What was that called again? Homiletics. It's now called Homiletics Online. Homiletics Online. And it is a, a journal that comes out monthly for what are called, or quarterly. It comes out quarterly, but, it's, but it, it records every single Sunday. And there's this thing in the church called the lectionary, and that's the scripture readings for the week that everybody agrees will they'll do pretty much no matter what denomination you are. And so this is a, a, a clearinghouse of um, ideas to be presented to denominations for individual pastors to subscribe. <clears throat> and so for it, in each quarter, there was a, a four or five pages, five pages for every Sunday, a sermon, uh, research, prayers, uh, children's story, uh, offertories, all sorts, of, all sorts of components that people could pick and choose from. And I got recruited because one of my graduate student buddies, who was also a writer, got recruited. And then he came and he recruited me in a sailboat. And so we're out sailing and he said, how'd you like to be a writer for these guys? I'll introduce you. And so I ended up writing 150 sermons. And it was great because, because I was writing sermons anyway and doing all this research anyway. And so for church, because I was a pastor. And so I just simply did a little extra work and I sent it to them and I got paid for it. And it was awesome. So it was like double, double dipping. But, but the great thing was, the best thing about it was, was that the, there were harsh critiques. The first page I got back as my audition piece, it was full of red ink. And it was brutal. It was brutal uh, editing. 
And so I went through this emotional response. Oh, my writing is terrible. Oh. And to, yeah. oh my God, these guys can help me become a better writer. And so um, I, I got critiqued all the time and it's the best thing that ever happened to me. I get critiqued for everything I do. Anything that I do, I try to get critiqued. And, and with writing in particular, um, it's, a, it's a skill, it's a learned skill. And so yeah. with editors working with you to shape sentences and idea flows um, and um, sticky language uh, and ideas and lots of things go into it. And uh, so anyway, and that's what I did. And that's what I did. Yeah, and I love that how you, uh, you know, all the red ink, oh no, I did something wrong. You know, we go back to that childhood, like grammar school, you know, we have these memories like, oh, I did something wrong. I didn't get my star. But uh, one of the things I got flat on, I went to uh, college uh, for um, uh, advertising and marketing and we got beat up because and then, yeah. and then when i went in the real world i mean we whatever we got beat up with it was nothing compared to it was brutal in college so i i was always used to edits and i didn't take it personally but because i got flat on it but if you're not used to that it's kind of shocking for you know for people to critique your work harshly so that's i kind of never cool. so i took a lot of writing classes but i it but i was a pretty good writer I mean, oh, well, you know, yeah. so, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> so, but then it turned out then it turned out they didn't think so. <laughs> so, which was the best thing that happened to me because it kind of broke my, it broke because, so I was an English major undergraduate in divinity school. You, all you do is write. And as a pastor, all you do is write. I wrote sermons every week. And so part of my whole NDE experience was to become a pastor so that I could write so that I could continue my dedication to practice of writing. Because I wanted to write every week and have a deadline every week. Um, but when no one's critiquing your style, it's easy to, you know, like, even though I read a lot of literature and working on my work, without someone there to say, that's a dangling participle, or that, you know, this comment does not go there. Um, so it was, it was brutally beautiful. No, that, that, I mean, that's something to be learned just right there, that nugget, um, because really, if we just embrace it to be better, and if it's done well, that, um, I, I agree with you on that. And you know what's interesting nowadays with that Grammarly? And you yeah, can, I use Grammarly. I, I love it, because it'll tell you, like, and it's funny, things have changed. It used to be like so-and-so and so and, and you didn't, but now you got to have a comma before and. Oxford comma. Oh. <laughs> and then, <laughs> And then what is the other one that's weird? This always seems weird to me still. It's where you go parentheses, but it's the end of a period. You have to put the period and then the parentheses. And that's, that's like, ugh. Right, Depend, but, it, but, there are, but there are provisos with that. Oh, really? Yeah, the proviso okay. is that if the, if the, if the parenthesis, if the parenthesis uh, is, it's, I, will, I, will, I don't want to get into the grammar, but just because we'll, we'll, we'll get way off track. We'll do that, we'll do that later. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm Right. Okay, but anyway, so let's go ahead and, and go on. Yeah, that's, uh, but that was interesting in itself. Okay, so I wanted to ask you about, can you talk about this, you, don't, you know, in, in code, about the possibility of this, um, this, this movie uh, from your sure, book? Is that, sure, uh, I, can, I can tell you what I'm allowed to tell you guys. Yeah, that's perfect. Uh, it's been uh, picked up by uh, uh, major studios, um, uh, uh, production companies, I should say, Pro two production companies that are an ex-husband and wife, um, and they have had some large success in their in the movie world, and uh, we're deep into it. The book was, and I might as well show it to you now. Yeah, please. Uh, the, the book was, um, it, it was written with a movie in mind, um, but also, it was not a movie. It's not a movie, so it needs to be uh, treated as a, to be retreated as a based on a true story. And so I'm, I'm adding, we've been adding elements, real, all the, the, the near death experience will be exactly true. And so will everything else in it. But I'm, but I needed, a, I needed a female uh, uh, plot point because I wasn't dating anybody at the time. And part of my experience is, is the conflict in my relationships. And so in order to express the conflict in my relationships and the change I underwent, in a, in, a, in a way that works in a feature film. We've take, I've taken a bunch of women and uh, girlfriends in my life and my wife, and I've made one large character out of this. And so there's, that, there's an arc going through it. So for the last eight or nine months, we've been working on that part of it. And when this is, will be completed in the next six weeks, that part will be done with. 
Then it moves in further down into development where they go for a major director, a major actor, and um, a major director and a, and a writer um, and the script writer. So those three components are next. Um, we have uh, an 18 month option. It's it, I, I, the, the reason this thing happened is because I was on boot at the gas pump. And the next day I got, a, I got an email and, and 10 minutes later, I'm on the phone with this woman who says, OMG, my near death experience was just like yours. Really? Yeah. So we end up in this like two hour conversation. And while we're talking, I'm looking her up. I'm vetting this person. Dun, 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 dun. And on LinkedIn, it's like, oh my God, she's a producer. Oh my God, these are the movies she made? Oh my God. And so, so then we ended up talking for like a year and a half on a regular basis. She's my buddy. She's my buddy. Oh, and then one awesome. day she says to me at Halloween a year ago, she says, so who's doing your movie? I said, what movie? She said, about your book. I said, my, you? <laughs> <laughs> well, you want to work with people you like and trust, right? And right. she was already your buddy. It just makes sense. And so then she went on, on, on the phone with her and um, she says, hold on, hold on. She, she, she puts me in hold for 20 minutes. She comes back and she says, I just talked to my ex. We are still partners in business. And, uh, we're, you know, he wants to read your book and we'll take it one oh, step wow. at a time. And so he read the book and we had conversations and he came back and he said, it's not, it's not quite a movie yet. So you need to do this thing. Can you do this thing? This based in a true story is like, fiction writer <clears throat> fiction reader literature major you know superstructure of all I, I writing is so much more than grammar you know oh, there's absolutely. so much more to it but it's so if you work with me i said so yeah. i'm 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 getting a writing education here i am in this part of my life and it's sort of like a person who's grown up painting watercolors all the time yeah. and suddenly they say same kind of brush but now you're in oils yeah and so I've been getting critiqued and working with, um, it's, been, it's been excellent for my brain and, um, and my art. I, I really consider oh, yeah. myself an artist more than I, I'm a creative. That's what yeah, I Yeah, you're very creative. Yeah, I'm a creative person too um, and a visual designer and also a writer and a slogan writer. And I'm always looking at branding. So you had to put on your, your hat, like what's going to sell, you know, what's so they're going to have to, they're going to have to get Bradley Cooper for you as the, uh, you know, the it's man. Somebody, somebody young, a hot young thing. A hot young. Okay. Hot young. Well, he looks good. Somebody, and then you got to get a beautiful woman on there, but you know, yeah. it, it's, there's a formula is what you're saying. They do look for, even though they have some truth, but there has to be, um, you even know, tennis some, has rules. Yeah. So did you do the uh, script yourself? Did you, are you oh, no, no, it I'm not or? doing the script. No, the script writer gets paid an ungodly amount of money. It's like, unbelievable. Oh, it's like, like unbelievable. And, um, and wow. it's such a super skill set. I, I want to, I'm going to be able to observe the process. And by yeah. observing the process, okay. I'm going to learn. Um, yes. But um, I don't know if I'll ever be a script writer. I have other, I have other works I want to write. And so this next book yeah. that I've been working on, um, I've got a writing plan. Um, and so that's going to, I'm going to move forward with that. And it's going to be a variety. I've got a variety. Of, it's all always spiritual because it's always mystical, but it's going to be uh, some more storytelling and some more um, story collecting, I guess. So know. this is the one that's called knowing God. This is knowing God. And this particular book is, um, so while we're, you know, so if you really want to know about my near-death experience, you can watch yeah. it on a video somewhere. <laughs> so, so, because this is We have so many cool things to talk about. I know, this is so much I more mean, interesting. Really, I mean, seriously. You, I know, this is way, I mean, not, not that everything is incredibly interesting, but what we, uh, Peter and I were talking about before we uh, got on this, uh, you know, the live interview, we were having a chat, is that the near-death experiencer has not only just had an experience and is over with, goodbye, but it's still living within them. Not only is that moment yeah. still uh, more real than anything else, it's like remembering your sixth birthday party. Uh, but it's it's but that uh, whatever you want to call it, that divine uh, wisdom, that uh, being a portal to the other side. We're getting information constantly, so we as near death experience are always evolving and thinking. Plus, we're getting information. I woke up. And it's not always like, hey, how about this? I mean, it's not always that. I wish it was. God's calling. Hold on. 
Yeah, exactly. I got a call from God. I just stop everything. But I, every now and then, they, I really get one of those. Like, this is what you need to do. I got a whole plan. I got something. This is it. And uh, this is, well, that's another thing we'll talk about later. But about, I, I occasionally do get that. But usually it's more subtle than that. But there's always that yeah. uh, underlying connection. And that's one uh, thing that I wanted to bring to life because you're doing some really cool stuff. So, um, gosh, I know with, with the movie and the different things going on. So um, maybe we could do this. Maybe you could highlight just as a timeline, you had this, not to, not to make it less because they can go. No, but I'll, 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 I'll fill in a little bit. Like highlight it and then highlight your books, how they evolve. And then we'll go back to the cool stuff you're working on. How about Okey that? Okie dokie. I love it. So, so in, in 1980, I was an exchange student to Montana State University from the University of Massachusetts, where I was an English major. I, I, was, I left my home uh, to get away from my family because my sister had vanished from our point of view, run away. My mom had a, a, a breakdown and my dad was very much struggling. And um, so I, I, I took off and I went out west and I went to Montana State. And when I was out there, um, and I should fill in the background a little bit. Um, I, I was a Boy Scout. I've been a Boy Scout since I was like, whatever, a Cub Scout eight, seven, I don't remember, yeah. um, of leader, well, was, winter camper, was, not, you were too? A brownie and a Girl Scout, yes. There we go. <laughs> um, so, and then I was a National Ski Patrol. Um, and uh, when I was in Montana, I was at, at Bridger Bowl. And so I, I say that stuff because I was an outdoors person. A winter camping outdoors person because because what I what happened to me is I died ice climbing, and so I've been a high mountaineer. I climbed all all over New England. My you know growing up, backpacking everywhere, and um, so one of the reasons I went to the West is to go backpacking and snow caving and you know work at the ski mountain and all this kind of stuff. So um, I found. Well, how a did that happen? If you were an expert, uh, I was not an expert climber. I was okay. an expert backpacker. I was a first responder. Um, I, I, was, I was very good rock climber, but I'd never done ice climbing, which is a related sport, but you know, the temperature is different and the equipment's a little, there's, the equipment is not quite the same. But I so, and I was with a, a, my partner, Tim, uh, my climbing partner, Tim, who we just met for this trip. We spent eight days snow caving which was excellent. We skied way into the back country, dug snow caves, slept in it, skied further into the back country. It was awesome. Mm -hmm. And we got to know each other extraordinarily well and partner up in terms of our compatibilities. And we were in, we were in, in Banff Provincial Park, which is in the Rocky Mountains in Canada. And so we get to the last thing. He, Tim wants to go to this ice climb. It's a world famous ice climb. Um, I geared up for it. He had all the gear. I geared up for it, but I came up short with my gear. And this is the problem. I okay. came up with one ice ax and an ice hammer. And a, an ax is like that big and a hammer is like that big, okay? And so, which basically means that when you put an ax into the ice, you can then let go and it, you dangle on a strap with a little bead held down here. And if you do that, okay. you can just like hang there. Wow. And it's, it, it, the only effort it takes is the expansion of your hand because there's no gripping. But with a hammer, you can't ever do that because this, cause the, the, the webbing piece is on the bottom of the hammer. Okay. And on the ice axe, it's partly up. It's physics. So it's like a third of the way up the shaft. So, so that was my... Uh, so well, it's well it slowed the... Thing. It's a mechanical thing. And, you know, Tim knew that this was doing... I was doing this. I was like 21 years old. I'm like... Yeah. <laughs> Let's do oh, it. Let's, let's do, do it. it. <laughs> um, so, so, but there were, there, <laughs> there were a bunch of teams on the climb that day. We weren't the only team. All right. There's maybe a dozen other teams. And so we're the last team there though. So we begin our climb and it becomes very apparent to me very quickly that this holding on to the hammer all the time versus this relaxing with the ax after I plant it was, was a super expenditure of extra energy that, was, that left me uh, exhausted. My forearms were like burned out. Oh. So because my forearms were burned out, because I was always gripping, 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 um, our climb took a lot longer, a lot hours longer. Oh, geez. Okay. So wow. that's, and, and so that's the thing. And the thing about climbing is people are like, why were you climbing? Well, 
because there's this meditative aspect to climbing where you become hyper focused in a single mindedness that you're only paying attention to this. There are no extraneous thoughts at all. Because if there are, well, you could die. Um, you know, get, make okay. a bad mistake, you could get hurt. You might not die. Not many people die climbing. People get hurt though. You know, you fall and you smack the rock. So it's a super focused thing. Okay. And um, and I was I'm I'm good at I'm an athlete. I'm good at I'm good at physical stuff. And so it's not like I it's and I got better after my near death experience. This is a weird thing that happened. Really? I yes, like yes. One of my one of my sci my after effects is like I I got high I got like awareness. Like I could I was studying martial arts and I, I and I, I and it was it was hard for me to get hit. It was like having the force, you know. Some people were quicker than me, but I could always I could always see it coming. And um, unless they blindsided me, but I was, I was fast. I was really, I got, I got super fast. So what art did you take? Uh, I took uh, Aikido, Wei Chi Ru, and Tong Su Do Muda Kwan. No, I don't know the last one. Uh, Korean. It's Korean. I uh, took eight years Korean Hapkido and I'm a, oh, black, yeah. I'm a black belt. And cool. I, and I was never, I was three years altogether. Oh, wow. It, and I'm, it's a couple broken bones later, but yeah, I, I oh, yeah. determined to do it. But when you're breaking that board with your fist, you could break your, you know, uh, bones in your hand. You have I to. I did. I broke a bone in my hand oh. breaking a board. You got to be, well, that's what you have. You can't. Well, that's what you're saying. You have to be focused with things like that. I wasn't focused, obviously, because I was, you know, because I was in, I was demonstrating in church. Oh, and it, and, oh, and so I'm, I'm like really not paying attention. I'm like paying attention to the audience, to the <laughs> congregation. You and of course, right of course right I, had, oh, I had to God. suck it up, okay? I sucked it up. I'm like, okay, I know I've just fractured my boxer's break, but I am not going to let on. <laughs> I'm just thinking of this whole comedic uh, scenario, like, and, and then... And Lord, thank you. Okay, but, but but let me just hey, let's do this right now. Bam! You know what I mean? Oh uh, no! Well, well, I was always doing. I was because I was a a, a creative person, a near death experiencer, creative person. I was always bringing new elements of education into the church. Like um, I I have a background in theater and a background in literature, and so I'm always sort of like using storytelling to, you know? So that was one of those things, that's all. No, just... I got it. <laughs> yes, you, were, you were trying to demonstrate with storytelling. Oh my gosh, what a card you are. That is funny, yep. okay. Suck that okay. pain. So, you, so anyway. So when we, did that happen, when you, were, when you had the hypothermia, or, or you oh were yeah. 21? I was 21, back to the mountain. No, and, and I wanted to know about you, yeah, back to the mountain, just for a minute. And the hypothermia, um, I don't really, to sound ignorant, know a lot about hypothermia. How did that start taking effect? And wh how did you know that you were in danger? Did you know? Uh, well, I was trained. I was a first responder at National Ski Patrol. I've been on the ski patrol since I was a sophomore in high school. Okay. So how did you know and yourself that this is well, not good? Well, what I'm saying is, is that I was trained to know. And okay. so, so in my, in my training, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll backpedal a second. We get to the top of the climb, it's sunset. And it, all the other teams had already descended by this point and were actually walking out, you know, five or 600 feet down. They've already made the climb, done the, done the rappel, packed their gear and were on their way out because the highway was not far away. It was an easy walk. And so the parkway. And so we got, we got to the top of the climb and because of my burned out arm, much late uh, to the sunset, dressed appropriately for the day, I might add, and, and just with the same gear as everybody else had, because it's a day climb. Got it. All right. So, but by the time we had an unusual circumstance, so by the time we get to the top, we've been sweating. And so even though I, I wore appropriate clothing, I was still wet on the inside. Oh, I got it. Okay. And so I'm curious about the mechanics of why. Okay. So when the sun went down and 30 degrees temperature drop like that, because this is March, um, and w the first thing that happened was um, we began our clattering jaw, like shivering. My body was, shi my body began to sh violently shiver. That's the old, that's kind of like the definition. You're vi I was violently shivering with my jaw clattering 
that if my tongue got in the way, I bit my tongue and I couldn't not, wow. I couldn't stop my jaw. And so we're, 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 we're shivering like this is bad. And so we did, de we decided um, that we were going to die there or we were going to die trying to get off the mountain. That was basically the choice. Die here for sure, or maybe die getting off the mountain. So we decided to get off the mountain. And so hypothermia runs through these. Wow. I could tell you all the, all the, the way it went, but I, but I, I'll go, I'll just tell you about the hypothermia to the point of death. Okay. So, so, uh, uh violent shivers, uh, loss of coordination. So you begin to become uncoordinated, okay. which is kind of dangerous, you know, in and of itself. Yeah. Um, we, uh, our brains started to, because our brains start to freeze. So when your brain starts to freeze, you lose, yeah. your, your arms are losing coordination and hands because the nerves are freezing. Mm -hmm. And I had frostbite. I still got frostbite problems all over me. My, all, all my appendages. I have all my appendages, but I got frostbite problems. Everything, you know, fingers, feet, toes, nose, chin, ear, you know, all sorts of places. And um, so that's on top of the hypothermia, which was not, you know, the first, the frostbite is dangerous, but not as dangerous as the hypothermia. So at least for me. Um, so the brain starts to lose its ability to think, uh, difficult speaking, difficult forming words. Um, then uh, we, that lasted a, a while as we continued to press on. Then when we finally got to the last repel, now we've come down one, two, and we're at the top of the third repel. And at the bottom of the repel is a um, hundred yards away is our car with the tent and the stove. And so, but we're 100, 150 feet up and we're clipped into the mountain with, uh, there's iron pins and rings and straps and the strap is hooked to my, my carabiner to my harness and Tim's over here and the rope gets stuck. And so then I'm yanking on the rope and it's stuck and it's stuck and I can't get it free. And now it's, it's like just before dawn. We've been on the mountain all night and, um, or it's like mm, dawn. I don't even know what time the sun came up. I don't even know. Could have been, I don't know. Actually, I just don't know. March in the mountains and the high mounts. For, for the peaks are like 15, uh, like 10 to 13,000 feet or bigger. So this is like big mountains, a um, lot of shadow. So uh, then I began to uh, fall asleep. And this is the next sort of thing. No, I'm sorry. That's not, that's not true. The next, the next thing that happened was um, I got hot. I felt hot. I, all of my blood felt like it rushed into my core. And I thought to myself, oh, this is my body telling me that I can lose a hand, but I can't lose my heart. Oh, this isn't good. And so, so now I, and I know this from my training um, that, you know, the, why, why are people who die of hypothermia often found naked? Uh, because, because they be themselves with somebody else? Because they get hot. <gasps> and it's all in their head. Oh. It's not real. And so I unzip my coat. I'm like, Tim, I'm hot. I'm like, he's like, Peter, don't unzip your coat. I'm unzipping my coat. I unzip my coat. Like, and it wasn't a lot of insulating fact to this coat. It was a shell. I unzip my shell and open up my shell. But, you know, now the wind's getting in on me. And so, but I'm hot. I'm, I'm now irrational. I know that this is true, that I'm not supposed to do that, but I do it anyway. And so then my temperature drops faster. And then I began to fall asleep. And then um, after I would I'd fall asleep and hit the rock and pull back up to pull on the rope, I stood up and the last thing that happened to me was uh, the uh, tunnel vision where your eyes, where, the, where you, you just watch the, the fade to black. Mm -hmm. and, and at that point, that's death. And, um, and then I... <clears throat> But I was like, oh, but I'm still conscious. How can, how can this be going on? Why am I still conscious? How come I didn't feel myself at the rock? I'm having all these thoughts, like what's going on here? And, and then suddenly the, this opening appears in front of me. And I know the mountain was supposed to be in front of me because, you know, or earth. There's supposed to be at least earth in front of me because I might have fallen. Um, but there was, it, was, it was infinite space, infinite space. Um, and it was, it was a, I could see that it was infinite space. It was all darkness, but I could see that it was darkness. I could see that it was infinite. And, and then from this incredibly far distance, uh, an unspeakable distance, a pin, pinprick of light 
appears and rushes toward me at an at faster than the speed of light and communicates to me telepathically i'm taking you and it's the most powerful voice i've ever heard and i have this incredible sense of this powerful being coming toward me i have the sense of of uh of intelligence like super duper intelligence coming toward me and i think you are not taking me and so i put up all of my resistance and i'm just plucked out of myself like a daisy in a field and I'm carried. And as soon as I'm carried, all of my confusion, all of my um, fear, everything's gone. Um, and now I'm enveloped in this inside the intellect, inside the love, and I'm being, I'm being carried up the tunnel. And, and the tunnel is wide and narrower and at the same time. And, and I'm, I'm content. I'm not afraid. Can I ask you something, not to interrupt this, because I'm following this. So when you, have you uh, at this point, uh, you, you haven't engaged seeing your body or anything at this point, you're just having a, the experience with the darkness and the go, wait, this doesn't look like the mountain. At what point did it look like a tunnel? I, I saw it's, a tunnel it's, too, it's, and it was a light. And then I was, I had the feeling of a tunnel. I have a, what was your tunnel like? In, instantly. It was instantly once what? I was, I was like, it wasn't like I was being, carried in the arms of the angel of, of the winged angel to heaven it's yeah. like i was inside the angel yeah and and as soon as i was inside the angel there was there was this the tunnel appeared it was the tunnel the light was the tunnel i don't know how how to describe it right. um, it was i was carried in it and i was carried through it and i and i could still see the the infinite expanse but the tunnel itself was like a containment unit like a like a cha like a channel you know, you almost want, because I, it, I didn't realize, but I think it was uh, PMH Atwater that only like 20% of people experienced the tunnel. And I experienced the tunnel. I couldn't control the tunnel. Oh, I couldn't control anything. I was out of, I was, and I was okay with it. Like, okay, no control. I'm in comfort. I, I hadn't, I was utterly swept away. It's like being a stick in the raging river. I was swept away. I had no, I had no power to do anything. Right. So at and that I, point, did you just like, hey, you know, this, this kind of just relaxed at that point? I did relax. I was relaxation itself. I was contentment and I was carried. And then the next thing I knew, sort of the, and it, I, did, I, did I pop into the infinite illuminated darkness or did I, or did it expand around me? I can't really tell you. Uh, maybe it was both of those things at the same time, but suddenly I was in being inside was like when i was inside the angel the messenger carrying me i was the intellect holding me i was sort of like in a in a containment like this but suddenly i was the containment unit was infinite yeah it was like it went from this to this and 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 it was an instant boom like that and i was I describe myself as an orb of consciousness, but uh, you know, this is all metaphor. So I was like a, I, I was like a bubble. I was like a, 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 a condensation of all of myself and more like a 10 times. I was all of all the, all of the whole of me was in one place at once. All of my senses, all of my intellect, all of my self awareness was one thing, but I had no body. I, w I was no, no molecules. No yeah. quarks, nothing. Yes, yes, I understand. Yeah, I, I know. It, it's funny because a lot of people would hear that and go, "Isn't that scary?" But strangely, like no. for me, it was. I didn't care. I mean, you go through a point you care, and then you're like, eh, you know, it's very. I don't know okay. wholeness. I don't know. It's like just no worry. I don't know how was it for you. I mean, when you were in that, didn't you feel kind of um, cradled, protected? Oh, I was content. I was me. My, my, first ex my first thought was, as I, so my thinking was my seeing, was my being. Okay, that's the first thing, is that I was a oneness. I was, they, you know, there was no separation and of, of even inside myself. And my first thought was, oh, this is me. This is the real me. It is. This is, this is who I am. This yeah. is who I've always been. This is what I, this is, this is, this is oh. me. Well, how did, I, how did I not know this was me? That's so beautiful. I connect with that so much. That's so beautiful. We're not this thing. Nope. Not this. This is just a model. You know, I'm going to upgrade my model at some point. <laughs> yeah. It's a, you're already carrying it, right? It's already in you. It's right there yeah. right now. 
but uh but abs but yeah we're so much more than that we are not male female no no gender brown white yellow no skin. All that mm -mm. no That's, culture yeah no we're uh so much more than that but we have forgotten it's yep. And it, that's that's beautiful because that's where our power lies because it's where the love is. So tell us so what so what happened? So you're in this point. At what point are you told to come back? How does that work? I mean, how do you? Well, I, I'm not told to come back. Um, I, I pop into this infinite space, and there's like a a, fl a living water flowage, like an it's also an opening and a portal and it's translucent and transparent and um and it's so it's solid sort of solid too and because it has form and i can see through it and i can see into it and i can see that it's a an opening and i can see the opening on the other side and i can see that it's a doorway and so all these all at the same time and i touch this thing with my consciousness and i am i'm infilled with the oneness of being i'm rushed inside of i hear my soul name called which is unpronounceable by my lips I see myself as a created creature, like a singular photon, like I was superpositioned between being all the, all the light particles of God and my individuated particle of God. I saw my long, eons long tail of my existence, of my soul, which is time, I'm also in timelessness. So there's a bit of a contradiction here. So I could see the eons length of my soul, <laughs> but I'm also in timelessness. Yeah, um, oh, I, I get it. Yeah, I could see other lives I had lived or were living, but I can't see into them now. And I could see my my skin on top, like my 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 Peterness was yeah. part of one of these existences. Okay. Yeah. So, but it wasn't me. None of these things were me. The so, only me was me. So this is interesting. I love. Like, we can just delve into this a little bit more. So. I uh, wanted to ask you uh, during so, so you were able not only to see a a uh, uh, what what I want to ask you a life review but really a and it, I don't even want to say past life but lives because is if there is no true time is there a such thing as a past and the that other is the question I, I mean you know I've done three hundred hours of past life but was it past life they were just lives I mean on, are are there just dimensions and layers and and I don't think time is we fully we know it here but so i want to talk about these different lives and then what about did you have a life review of peter yeah i did i i went through all of the suffering i gave everyone in my entire life oh from their God. point of view times ten thousand. i went through a hell of my own making and i suffered all of their pain and it turns out karmically that all the pain that i gave away i actually gave to myself oh. only it wasn't you know every time i thought i you know needled my sister it turned out it wasn't needling. It was like running her over. Well, I won't even get graphic, but it was 10,000 times worse than what I thought I was doing. And so I suffered all, and it was a life review from their point of view of their emotional status. And I experienced their emotions that I gave to them, that I caused intentional emotions to people and unintentional ones from their point of view, juxtaposed to simultaneously all of my justifications for causing all these things. Oh God, yeah, I hear you. So let's talk about this part. You were saying that the ones that were aware of like, oh, I don't wanna talk about that, I remember that. And then seeing it from not your point of view, but their point of view, which is interesting. Uh, years ago, I think in my twenties, I read Danny and Brinkley, Saved by the Light. And he was talking about his perspective. I don't know if you've read that book about the same perspective from uh, when he killed the people in war and then he would feel it from that, the man and then the family, the pain. What about the unintentional stuff? Because I think that's that's a little scary because the things that we do out here now that maybe we should have called that person back, we should have been kinder, but it's the either neglect or the things we didn't know about that were hurtful. Talk it's, about it's, that. It's unavoidable. I also could see, I could see, I had this heavenly perspective and I could see twice in this, twice in this experience, I saw all humanity. The first time that I saw all humanity was that I could see that that it was not our fault. We're not to blame for being in this matrix. That the functionality of this world makes it impossible for us not to hurt others. The functionality of the world means that we are going to hurt other people, and that and that the the, the the sins mm -hmm. that I had committed were of a, a an equal of an equality with all of humanity and uh, of an inequality only with god and so my 
suff causing of suffering was the voice, the voice, capital T, capital V, was saying inside me simultaneously, I love you, I know you, I've always known this about you. This is the way the universe is made. This is how people are. It's not your fault that it's made this way. I love you as you are. And so there was this, there was this, this is my near death, my um, life review was very painful, but it was also a, a relief because, because also all the love I'd given away in my life and all the love that was given to me in my life, I also kept. And it weighed much more. It was more valuable than all the suffering that I ever, ever gave away. But here's the proviso, because it was more valuable because, because of the divine love. Because the divine love, the love is of heaven. And so the voice, I love you, I know you, I made you, I've always known you. You're my beloved, you're my creature. I'm in, I, I love you, I forgive you, I forgive you. Here's the, here is this outpouring in which I was just this infilled with the, with love, beauty, adoration, truth, knowledge, understanding, uh, intelligence, perception, uh, awe. Um, uh, uh, I, the list is so long. Truth, uh, the and all of these things are are, are fragments of love. They're all like peace and wholeness and healing and wellness and forgetfulness of suffering. All these things are all part of the love itself. And I was infilled with this to the, to the, and I was 10,000 times bigger. I was as a, than I, I am as a human being. And I was filled, infilled to the point at which one more drop would have obliterated me. I was like almost to a point of pain, but not. It was, it was pleasure beyond explanation. And I was in the oneness of being. I was, in, I was in the fullness of the oneness of being. And I said to the voice telepathically, am I dead? The voice said, yes, you're dead. I said, well, I can't die now. And the voice said, why not? I said, because my mom and my dad, my mom had a you know, nervous breakdown. It lasted 10 years. It was terrible. Um, it was ongoing. There was a, the, my, what I haven't told much about is that there was a child involved. Uh, there were two kids, two babies involved, and there's and one. It's like even worse than I've ever described, and so uh, publicly anyway. So, so in an instant, God took me and showed me all of Earth and all seven billion human beings and everyone. And this is like a live feed of everybody's life all at once, like seven billion screens. It's like in the X Men, where 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 Charles is in the yeah, room. Yeah, I love that. With the, yeah, Magneto. It, Magneto, yeah. that's right. It's 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 like that. Only wow. only I'm I'm still in heaven with God, yeah. and I'm seeing this on Earth, and and I'm seeing everybody's covered by the veil of unknowing. They unknow. They don't know. They for the veil of forgetfulness. That's a better way. The veil of forgetfulness. Well, and so the wow. voice says to me, in the way that I love you now, you now know that I've always loved you, and I, my love for you is eternal, infinite, um, and it was is and always will be and because of that love you're whole and and you're all you're always safe you're always saved you're always in my presence i am i am i am all that there is and all that there will be and i made you and i love you my 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 special child the particular one i love and i love every single person particularly and because of my infinite love, I can do that. And because of my infinite love, your parents, their suffering will come to an end. You now see everyone's suffering comes to an end. Their suffering will come to an end when they die. And in an instant of time, because we're in timelessness, they'll be here and all will be over. But God also showed me all of their suffering without me in their life. Oh, really? Interesting. So, so when you basically had a request to God, and that was request not really for you, but out of concern for your mother and my father, your parents, yeah, your parents in general. Um, so he responded by showing by you being there and not being there, like two scenarios. And, and but go? also, but also showing me timelessness and love. The love was immense. I can't even exp I, You know. I do know. It, it, it's, it's, it, it's, inex, it's inexpressible. I always say, if I sell it too much, people are going to want to go drink the Kool-Aid. All the, you know, the good thing is there that um, there is, um, I mean, when I think of it, there's so much abundant love 
um, it's like, you can't ever imagine thinking horrible about yourself or like, oh, I didn't do this or I didn't do it. It was none of that. That was gone. So much. There's so much love that in that presence with, with me is that it's kind of like you were just, it's hard to express. It's like you were basking in joy and ecstasy. And yes. it's just like this was, and it felt like earth, um, it's just a memory and it, and it's just, to me, it's like lab class, but it, but it was just a memory. But to me, the real place felt like heaven. Yes, exactly. It was the real, what it was my home. That? Do you, that is, and people say, oh, the home and whatever. But to me, it was so the sensory, there were so many senses beyond here mm. and there was no, um, you know, uh, dichotomy of right and wrong and this and that and and we have these strange ideas and da, da, da. it was none of that so um <clears throat> to me i mean i didn't want to come back i didn't have a request to come back uh, so. I, didn't, I didn't want to come back you didn't I, chose, <laughs> I asked to come back i asked to come back because I, I i wanted to what i wanted to do was alleviate my parents suffering as i could if i could how did that, how did that work out? Did God show you, like, if you came back and obviously you honored that, how, how would it work if you had stayed there versus not staying there? What did he show you? Do you recall? Well, yeah, he showed me, he showed me their life without me. How did that look? It was all full of suffering, much more oh. suffering. Oh, no. We'll was, see. Yeah. So there was a lot more suffering. And, and, and even though I know, I knew and know that timelessness means that their suffering when I was dead, there was no suffering. Suffering was gone. Yeah. And, and, and so I knew that was going to be true for them and it will be true for them. And my dad's back in the hospital again today for like, oh, the, eighth, awesome. for like the eighth time in the last year. It's not, oh. it's always, it's been. Oh my goodness. That's so, awesome. so, so this is, you know, I'm living this out still. I'm still living that choice. And, um, I get it. And so are they. And so, so I, I said, can I, it, my parents are going to suffer. Can I, do I, do I have to stay? And God said, you don't have to stay. I said, well, oh, he said, I want you to, God said, I want you to stay. It's your time. Come home. Come home now. I said, I haven't gone through the tunnel yet. You have to go. Come on. Come on. You have to go the rest of the way. I've, I, had, I went into this, to this, this flow, but I didn't enter into the kind of gateway like the next step. Right. And um, I said, well, if I go back and I come back here to this oneness of being, this ecstasy, this bliss, this, this end of all suffering. And God said, yes, you can come back here. I said, well, then I choose to live my life. And God said, you won't live your life and sent me back. And on the way back, I had, I had a choice of a million different entry points into my life into the life of Peter, but there were all these different entry points. And, um, Explain the, it. what do you mean by entry point? Well, like, like, like there was, there were all these tunnels that led to me. Okay. But, um, or like op, like optic fibers that led to, into me, but all these optic fiber cables, they were all interrelated to each other. And so, so I could see that I could see all the, I could see all the probable lives I would live. And so, Huh. Okay. So they were, so you had to pick really quick. Well, which one? That fast. And I remember thinking, uh. I kind of like my bohemian lifestyle. And so, <laughs> and so I was given this, uh, and they were sort of concentric, sort of concentric. And toward the center was the, was the purity of the whiteness of the light of the being itself. And so I chose to come in, not in the center of it. I chose to come in to the side of it, not, in, not to the far outside, um, but not, but closer to the light part of it, but not right in the beam of it because I wanted, I, I, I wanted some autonomy. And so I, that's, and the next thing I knew I was in my body, uh, being crushed into my body painfully back into my, my dead body. And, um, and when you I, woke up, where were you, where did you, I, wake was, up to? I was, I was dangling on my harness. Jeez. And my painful body that was filled with pain because I'd also forgotten pain. When, when you forget suffering, you forget pain. So suddenly I, you know, was racked with pain and I didn't, that was the first experience I had coming back with suffering. Like I enter the body suffering. Absolutely. Pain sucks. I always say that. Not a big pain fan. Pain sucks. Not a big, not a big fan of pain. 
the, the, you know, this is, this is fascinating, all the decisions that you had to make very quickly, but it was, if you think about it, you made a decision based on love, altruistic and love. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was love and God honored that. That's, I mean, that's just, that's, that's beautiful in itself. So, so you were found, uh, real, you, you, so kind of take us real quick, you, how you're found, you came back. When did you start uh, remembering all this? Uh, the moment later. immediately I was, I was like, uh, suddenly I'm in, but you know, uh, I'm in a painful body. i still have hypothermia. I still have frostbite. I'm still on the, on the cliff. I'm it's still, you know, we're still in a deadly situation and I, uh, uh, I'll spare all the details, but I eventually I was able to, my brain came online and we self rescued and, um, and, and then we, and then we did, we self rescued at the bottom too, when we did the first wow. day. Um, and so, cause it was that or die. So, um, die again, but immediately yeah. upon return, I was wondering what is going on. I knew that I was, I was like in a thing. I was in a thing inside this world that I knew that I was not wow. this thing. I knew that I was like, Limit. what is this? They're very limiting these things. <laughs> very limiting and confusing. And, um, and it took, it took, it took by the, by the time we were, we were later that day when we were in the car, uh, driving back to Montana or, uh, um, and other terrible things ensued. Um, the, I had begun to be in my body again, but I, but my soul was still like up here. Mo my, my spirit is not fully engaged in my body. I am not a hundred percent here. I'm, I don't know what the percentage is, but most of me is up there. Uh, uh, you're talking to me. I'm a medium and you talk about meditating. I pop out all the time. I mean, I love living there. I am. That's where, I mean, look, I, I, I act normal, I act normal, I guess, yeah. but People that know me, when I, you can see, I'm like, <laughs> are you gone again? I'm like, it just, cause it, because you know how to get there quick. It feels good. I mean, it's not home home, but it's a... Um, close it's, enough. It's closer it, than it's, here. It's, 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 it's a version. I, you, you know, people do it with meditation, but, but I find a lot of near-death experiences can do it very quickly. I will. I can do it really quick and come back really quick, like even in a car, because it feels good, doesn't it? It does. I have those experiences too. It, I know you do. I know most of us do. And it, it just, uh, but you don't have to die to experience that. Uh, we're all from heaven. You don't have to die to experience that, which is what you, you, uh, do with your meditation and your, uh, not church. Yep. And uh, I, I'll, I'll quickly jump ahead and say that the reason why I'm, I'm doing what I'm doing now is because of my second near death experience and long story short there, I had a heart attack in the ambulance. Um, I had run 5K the day before, but I get a family genetic thing. And so um, I died in the ambulance. I chose to come back again. I, I went partway up the tunnel um, with my angel, my buddy. Um, and I chose to come back this time for my granddaughter. Long story. Brand new oh, baby. Uh, husband had gone to war, came back broken, bad things. Um, so. Okay, got it. Right, so wow. Again, love. Again, love. You chose love. But then my TV show, uh, the TV station said, uh, new corporate owners. I was on the air for 15 years. New corporate owners, they're going to phase you out. Can't tell anybody. Um, and so uh, then the show closed. I, my book was coming out at the same time. Heaven is Beautiful. It's 2015. The book was coming out. It came out when I was in the hospital. Um, and the next thing I knew, you know, nine weeks later, I was on Fox and friends in New York city, like with lots of makeup. Cause I was still pretty pale. I had damage. I had, I had a lot of damage in my heart. Um, it was not just a clean death, uh, or a clean heart attack. It was lots of trouble. And so, um, so we're back to, to pain. <laughs> we're back to pain. But the, but what it did to me, my, my first into the experience reoriented my life completely. I went from being uh, an English major aiming towards graduate school in architecture to work in the family architectural business um, outside of Boston um, and to becoming going to Yale Divinity School and, and again, you know, uh, studying mysticism and, and meditation and um, getting ordained as in the United Church of Christ and uh, hiding out inside the church as a mystic. Um, and um, Hello, I'm with you. Right. And I'm with you, buddy. <laughs> right. I know. I think there's, I think there's a bunch of us. 
And um, so I, then I went, you know, church pastoring and can you hear that ding? Yes. What is that? That is my, that's my executive producer writing to me right now saying, I just finished the second read ready to talk. Well, so, this is good. Well, you know, hey, we're opening that portal. They're making it happen for you. <laughs> that's right. She says really great things in here. She says really great things. Good. Well, of course. Well, the thing is, you know, and it's funny because what you're talking about, I just, I got the chills right now. Uh, what you're talking about is about how you're, you know, the, at what point your life took a pivotal change from where your studies and to, uh, you know, now going into the spiritual aspect versus the architecture. And yep. then now here you are with the show going, oh, we're going to phase you out. And then with the heart attack. And then now, you know, here you are branching out on your own, uh, your own, uh, you're like a, you're a renegade. You're a spiritual renegade. How do you like that? Mm, Actually, yeah, I am. Spiritual Renegade. Actually, that'd be the name of a good book. Spiritual Renegade. Yeah, it would be. It would be really good because that's kind of you. Um, and True. But, you know, it, it's funny when I hear you talk, uh, you know, the choices that you made, that, uh, ultimately we all make choices, but this, this is like, bam, you have to make a choice. Uh, you know, I want to talk about heaven and earth and about the love and about, you know, why we're here. I want to cover that. Like why you think that we're here. Love. It's, it's such One a word. operation. It's just, a little, I mean, there's, it's just, you know, and I'm like, don't, we, we don't get it right. I, I mean, sometimes, I mean, you know, uh, I'm a pastor too. And I'm like, well, who, who I would have, whoever thought that. Uh, but, uh, but the thing is like, why, why so can't humanity get it? Why can't we be kind to one another? I mean, I don't, I'm like, it's frustrating. And then I'm thinking, but I know in the end, it, everybody goes, ah, oh, we're all pals. You know, <laughs> Right. It but has a happy ending. It has a happy all, all the actors walk off the set and go have a beer together. Uh, you know why? It's true. Or it's like the wrestlers, you know, where they would like, and they right. wear costumes. And the costume might be, you know, I'm a whatever and somebody else is whatever. And, and then we, at the end, they, they go have the beer. But why, why do you feel, uh, I'm very curious, um, that we go through this drama like a play here when it really is just as simple about love and why is it that we need to have comparisons to learn? Why is this? Are we that stupid and slow? I, I don't, I don't know. When I was dead, I knew everything that I needed to know. I knew everything that I wanted to know. And it wasn't just a little bit of information. It was all the information, any, every subject that I thought about, I had all of the information, not on earth, but right. all of the information of the universe and yeah. God inside me. And so in terms of my, my, to me, uh, this is a stupid place. I'm stupid here. I'm, <laughs> I am, I am like so dumb and dull and I'm just like, ugh. And, um, do you ever look in the mirror and you go, I know that's not me. Do you ever do? Oh, every, every, there is not a moment of my life that I go through with not knowing that I don't, I live inside this. I mean, but you know, it, it, it you know, and the thing is, I think, uh, it's interesting because I'm also used to being very active and athletic. As you get older, it's like, wow, my knees hurt. Oh, and yeah. So, well, there's that. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's a real pain. <laughs> you know, and you get older, you're like, because you know this, you're not this, you know that. And I'm like, and you're going, okay, why do I have to experience this with this model getting older? And now my freaking knees hurt. That You know how you just get up when you were like. Well, because that's the nature of yeah. all of the universe. The, you know, the whole universe consumes itself. It ex, it's, it's expanding, but it's also consuming. You I mean, mean like we, a vacuum? No, I mean like, like um, supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies sucking in entire star systems. Well, that's what I mean, like a, like a yeah. vacuum yeah. sucking it out. Uh, so, um, so, this, this so let's talk about the life force. So the life force, we know the being is that, that it's, it, we're nothingness, but yet we're everything. So, uh, and then yet we're squeezed back into these teeny little bodies, these teeny life, whatever life you have, no matter how magnificent, it's nothing in comparison to the grand base of there. So why is it that we, and we agree to keep coming back a lot of times. And again, it's probably for the love. I'm sure it's for the love, but where do you think humanity as far as making a progress and how do you see it? Oh. Um, you know, because, you know, yeah, in that state, 
you know everything, then you come back. And then what we were saying earlier, like Peter, you know, in part, and certain things that uh, I don't know about you, but at certain times, like I don't really know something, and all of a sudden, instantly I know it because they're ready for me to tell me, or I'm ready to remember. I, I hear, I hear, that's yes, that's my experience on a regular basis. Isn't that weird? And why now? Like all of a sudden, like well, and so, so normal people <laughs> will say, "Well, don't you remember so and so?" I I remember glimpses, and then one day I remembered everything, and then now sometimes I won't know something, then I'll instantly know it. So I think it's. It's um, all, I think it's all there. I just think that they want you to remember certain things at certain times. Yeah, I don't even, I don't even, I, I, I've long since given up asking questions like why. Yeah. I, ask, I, 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 reserve, my, <laughs> I, I reserve my why questions for my, for my children and grandchild. Why did you do that? <laughs> um, so or why do you want me to do that? Or, or, and, for, <laughs> and, and for science, but for spirituality, I yeah. try, I find that it's a, it's a waste of my time because, because they are ultimately unknowable questions, at least for me. Someone else might know the answer, but for me. So I, I tend not to ask that question. I tend to ask uh, action questions. What am I, what am I doing right. to create more space inside myself and my life for the presence? Because in this limited body, I couldn't bring the totality of myself back with me. And I couldn't bring the totality of heaven back with me. So I, I, I've spent my 40 years of my life trying to create an opening channel inside myself again and again and again, repeating, repeating, repeating in order to be as much in heaven as I can while I'm here and to bring as much heaven as I can while I'm here. And that to me is my job. So when I can talk about my purpose in life uh, as opposed to the generalized purpose, which I think the generalized purpose is love. That's because that's what I think. That's what I experience. So, but my specific purpose is a mess is a messenger. I'm a messenger, not the messenger. I'm just one of them. And my job here is to communicate using all the tools that I have, right? All the tools that I have yeah. um, that you listed out in the beginning, all of those are in the employ of God. All of them, every single thing that I do. That when I was a church pastor, I never worked for the church. I only worked for God. When I worked for the people, I never really worked for the people. I worked for God. I hear you. Yep. And so, yeah. it's the, so it's one boss. One boss. And and this <laughs> and all of these things that I do in action, you know, everything from you know sitting on the domestic violence homicide review panel. You oh, know, that sounds really interesting. Yeah. yeah. How did you but, get involved with that? I got the, the governor, I got brought to the governor and the governor, I got nominated to the governor, the governor appointed me. And um, I have a background in working in domestic violence in the church. Oh, um, yeah, we did, we, in the local level, uh, yeah, it was part of my, my, my fearless ministry because I come back kind of fearless. And so, right. especially, especially where human trauma and violence is involved. And so I, I, one of my, one of my after effects is um, compassion for those who are uh, the least and the most wounded. Um, and so that's been a, um, anyway, so, so that's why I ended up on that. That, that, uh, no, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. It's so funny that these things that you're saying, oh my gosh, I mean, I feel so blessed just hearing you talk. Uh, because I think you hit a couple of things that, um, you know, I'd like to point out because they're pretty cool, pretty amazing. Uh, but I think that when you said, um, that we're messengers and you do it through different forms of communication, uh, the good news is you're not alone. I'm doing right. it. Other people are exactly. doing it. A bunch of people. And, and, and it was funny because I was told I didn't want to come back and said, but your mom needs you. And he, I showed before and after, you know, I'm like, okay, yeah, okay. Uh, I said, she'll be fine. And she said, no, really, you need to show her love. Um, but um, I, I ha had to be kind of talked into it. Uh, and then when uh, they, he, I was told you're not alone, there'll be other people doing this too. And so my whole life, I was like, you know, I knew it was kind of back there. I didn't really ask. I just was in the back of my mind, like, who are these freaking people? And, uh, and I kind of loved everybody. So it was fine. But I, it was just right. that. But now I know, because the people that have had near death experiences usually to me, it's like, uh, I mean, I would go as far to say it, like a compulsion. I mean, like a compulsion I, is the word I use. Compulsion. 
And I'm like, I've been this way as, you know, I had mine early on, but I, you know, questions. I was in the library. I was the strange kid reading all these odd books and Same wanting to here. know, really, and uh, reading Edgar Casey really young and then, uh, all, you know, whatever, Swedenborg, different ones. And, and so it's, um, and then I had a compulsion with, uh, with, with spirit, with uh, near-death experience. And, I, and then what finally, what it was is I finally have been uh, researching coats and finally I just put on the coat. Yeah, yeah, that's the difference. Um, but it, it, it was kind of, it was so funny. Uh, yeah, it, it was, and it, and it still is. I mean, it's because, I think it's because it's what I agreed to, and I'm, and I'm into it. I don't know. I definitely agree with it now. And yeah. I've agreed with it from the moment I came back. And, um, and it's the, the the tools that I use to communicate it are secondary to the to trying to channel it into the tools, trying to channel it directly to the people. That, and so my whole my whole goal isn't so much to create um, books and movies and whatever else I'm doing. It's to uh, be the presence, be in the presence as much as I can to bring as much presence in the world as I can, to get out of the way. And 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 I find that and I've had this experience with you today several times now okay. even. <laughs> Well, where, where you feel the presence itself between us. Because I do. Thing, I, right? do. I Actually, I was so, I, I, with the last time I did an interview with like uh, Ingrid Honkula, I was so high and She's, we were almost finishing each other's sentences. I, I mean, literally, you know, hi, like hi. Oh, I know Ingrid. Hi. She's a radiant being. Oh, she is a radiant. And, I'm, and I have to tell you, like when we're talking about this, I'm starting to get really high again. Yeah. I don't know about you because it's not That's, feeding off of each other's energy. We're because I don't need that, or nor do you. We're the presence is here. It's always here. It never well, goes away. But, here, but 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 we sh but we like share it between <laughs> us. Is that what you're saying? We share it. Yeah, because I feel like we're both portals to whatever. Yes. But I'm 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 like woo. This is I didn't expect this after doing these interviews. But some people I will get high is the best word to say. It, euphoric euphoric and it's kind of like a it feels like an altered state but when you were and i think it's because i'm kind of riding your rainbow trail but like when you when i saw you do the and i want you to talk about your non-church um uh, but when you do the meditation and so forth at first i'm like oh you know and so let me take some time to really go back and look at this and i went through it and i went oh my gosh he's doing kind of like what I do on stage, what we're doing. You're, you're bringing the light to the people. That's what I'm doing. That's what not church is. Not church is, is an, is it's built around. It's an experience. It's trying to ex create a space to experience the divine directly. And the space that I'm using, the tools that I'm using are the, are the mystical teachings of Jesus um, primarily um, in my meditations. Um, you know, I'm, I, I go anywhere I want to go, you know, Lao Tzu and Zhuang Tzu and, you know, Rumi and Kafir for, because all of those mystics are all carrying the same, every mystic speaks the same language and the language has no words. And I'm trying to create the space where in using words and not, and not church um, by examining, by deconstructing the false teachings by presenting the truer teachings, not like I'm the, the true teacher, but Jesus was a, was a mystic speaking the language of light. He's a code switcher. He speaks two languages at the same time. He's always talking in metaphor and everybody thinks he's talking about this place here, but he's not. They, you know, they hear the word heaven and they still think it's here. But um, so I'm trying to unpack the mystical teachings of Jesus as a vehicle to experience the message itself. Wow. Well, I tell you what, I, I totally get this. I, well, I'm a fan of Jesus because I saw him twice over there and I'm like, I, uh, I mean, it's just, I love the mystical stuff. I said that I love the early apostles. I love you go deep and you see that. Um, what do you think about, um, you know, if you go back and trace, you probably know a lot of this, uh, more about this than me, but if you go back and trace like a lot of the, uh, early Jesuits or the, what, uh, St. Ignatius. Ignatius uh, and, uh, yes, I'm, oh, yeah. I'm Yep. Yeah. And matter of fact, he goes around, to, he's come to me in dreams before with a donkey, just saying parables. And, and he goes, Oh yeah, I'm with Jesus. And I'm like, okay. And he just said so much about parables, but when you trace it, trace it, trace it back. I mean, a lot of this, um, it was a common place to have miracles, to know that you're a spirit being, to have, uh, 
gifted abilities. I mean, you know, that was a normal state of being. And then somehow, uh, which we, and, and to know our true essence more so, and somehow, I don't know how, but we got, we forgot that as time went on. I think a lot of it has also to do with control and controlling the masses. And mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> should I say that? Is that bad? Is that? No, is no, I think it's absolutely true. Um, <laughs> and it, because here's the thing. So, so the, the spirituality was controlling the masses and, and, and they were doing it for health reasons and societal reasons, tribal reasons, um, structural reasons, like in societal structural reasons. Um, but you know, they were using it as a tool to create civilization. So for instance, um, until the law of Hammurabi, the rule where an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, which uh, uh, in Hebrew, they, uh, the Hebrew people adopted that until the law of Hammurabi, you know, it was, you poke out my eye, I cut off your hand and yeah, kill it was your child. It was like, uh, the law. it was like, it's what they did back then. Yeah, but they, but before that, that was an improvement is what I'm saying. Oh, God. So that, what I'm saying is that's an improvement oh, over what it used to be before that. And what it was before that is you poke out my eye, I kill your child. Okay. Oh, an improvement. Right. Okay. So, 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 so here's this, here's this huge step forward in civilization. Um, because, because the warring tribes now have an equality of, you know, destruction of each other, each other. If you cut off my hand, I cut off your hand. You know, um, I don't burn your village to the ground and kill all your people. Um, so what I'm saying is, is that religion served a purpose in society in order to create a societal structure for the well-being of the tribe. Right. Okay, so this tribe of people, as opposed to the other tribe of people, which we're still warring against, right? Um, so religion had its sociological impacts, but I think that spirituality got swallowed up in particular mm -hmm. during the age of enlightenment when science five uh, no five you know i guess 500 years ago is when it started but um with copernicus and all that kind of stuff but when the age of reason really came on board religion yeah. religion tossed out mysticism is that what well, you know it's funny because then you have the uh during that time period and there was what is it you have the uh what, what reformation and what, oh yeah the great awakening all those oh, oh right and then and then finally then we had uh uh, where it was on uh, spiritualism became very big and then we had we had a lot of discoveries with um uh you know science but then you know that kind of got um uh, well, what I'm saying is that there was a there was an inflection point, following the following the Reformation, which is pre pre Enlightenment, pre scientific thinking, and and when scientific thinking entered into the general societal zeitgeist, mm -hmm. uh, it it um it had a had an impact in religion, in religion because religion became fearful of science. It began with opposition. The Scopes Monkey Trial is an example, right? And it became opposite. And so religion itself adopted scientific thinking. Like Darwinism. Yes, except for that in the, in the, in the evangelical right, uh, they became, they, they used logic and analysis in a closed circle, the Bible, nothing outside it. And in the, and in the mainline church, they used logic and reason um, to the exclusion of spirituality because because they, they adopted the scientific model and they developed historical critical thinking and, and biblical analysis and all this kind of stuff. But these two streams, evangelical, ch evangelical church and mainline churches, they, they both come from fear of science. And so at the point at which science became a dominant, began to become a dominant rationalism, yes. mysticism got tossed out, uh, with, you know, just was tossed out. And if you were a mystic, if you had, if you had a divine experience of any kind, and near-death experiences are just a type of mysticism, there are other kinds of mysticism all in the same kind of categories, which is what my, this is now I'm talking about my third book. And um, in, in, in that mysticism is a much bigger category, but it was, became taboo to talk about. It still is. It still way. is. It still except, is to a degree. Except, and I think that people don't understand it. I think that uh, mysticism to a lot of people uh, goes into the world of the occult and, they, and then they, their head goes into this dark area. Well, yep. I'm, that's, a that's, not, that's not what I'm talking about, but that's where it goes. And it's also supposed to be defiant because like you said, this nucleus of the Bible, 
But then what about the, uh, you know, the writings of the Gospel of Matthew or the, uh, the Book of Enoch is one of my favorite books. I love that book. But certain books were not put in and not to even mention, uh, you know, surrounding that. How did that come to be? What about the history before that? How did this come to be? So um, it's still, uh, it's still unpopular to to ask that because um, sure. there's a safety to people here. I don't have any problem. That's fine with the Bible. I don't have any problem with that. But there's so much more that you can actually have more depth to understand it. But uh, that's why growing up, you know, Presbyterian, it was very boring to me. And I'm not, I'm not to offend any Presbyterians. <laughs> um, but that's what later in life I saw Pentecostals. I'm like, what are they doing? They're like healing people, laying hands. I'm like, this is at least more exciting. Uh, and it was seemed very, some of the stuff they were doing very mystical to me, but um, it's back to uh, the presence of beingness and back to what you were saying in that presence. Yeah. Uh, it, that, that, that didn't take the form of any uh, man-made conjured religion or anything. It's just so. Yeah. It's, it's just, just, it, it just, what is the I am? It's the it's I am. The, uh, it's the I am, the I ineffable am. I am. It's the I am, which is. I do, I do you think that there's a big change going on though? Um, two, things are, yeah. two things are happening. One is that science takes no belief and science is going to deconstruct the Bible. Evolution's real. The age of the planet is not 10,000 years old. So all the, all the, all the false narratives that um, frightened biblical scholars have presented are going to be, they're being deconstructed now. I mean, that, that's just the way it is. So there's science. And then the other thing is science is driving spirituality, driving an awakening globally. Now tell us a, a little bit about that. Cause that's, that's kind of, that's come up a few times. I always thought they were opposed to one another, but how do you see them as opening the door to mysticism and opening the door to that and validating that how do you i i don't think they're validating it i think that i think that they're creating mystics through resuscitation so oh because i got it okay i got it because uh, so, too many people are coming back that yeah. have medical this person absolutely flatline they're yeah. they're code blue and here they are and they have no brain damage which is completely impossible that and, kind of stuff. and they tell stories about near-death experience and it's and it's there are 10 to 20 million in the united states alone and it's been going on since cardiac care came online in the 1960s and this technology has spread globally so it's not just white protestants and catholics and in the united states um it's 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 everybody it's an it's it's everybody everywhere of every color of every creed across the globe oh yeah um, believers and non-believers of every color of every it, it's and and we're starting to talk here we are and for here the first are. time so for the first time in history science has been creating spiritual people creating mystics and unprecedented numbers 10 million in the united states alive today of every color and, and nationality Absolutely. Just here alone. And what we're doing here, one, one of the reasons why I wrote this book is to try to get near-death experiencers to talk about it to somebody. Talk about it to somebody. Talk about it to somebody near you and somebody that you can trust because, because with social media is connecting us all, all over the world. Absolutely. And what I'm, what I'm believing, and I'm not a believer, okay? But what I'm believing is that the message that we're all bringing because my evidence is showing it so far is love that love is the unifying word whether you're um it doesn't matter where you're from uh, if you go far enough into the divine and death this is the message you bring back with you and so so here's this thing that's you know people in russia people in china people in north korea people in south korea people in and uh, kuala lumpur people in washington dc people in Menip and winnipeg all over the world Absolutely. coming back with the same freaking message yeah it is uh it, it was interesting i don't know if you've ever been a, a lab rat or someone studied you before which is back to science uh i've had that happen and it's it, and i learn you know it's funny it's it's not that we're just here to give 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 although that you know i think that you may think that but i i get a lot from learning about other people and being in this world and 
you know, sharing and so forth, but being a, being a lab rep at a university. And I found out that one of the, my near death experiences that said that, um, uh, that you have much to do, it's time to come back. Well, I was told the guy was re researching another person doing who had different people in Africa who was eat, being eaten by a tiger. And in his language, it said the same thing. Now, I don't know if God hits a record button, but I found that, that that's a common statement. And then we're finding these commonalities as I go along, like, oh, there's only so many people with the tunnel. It, every, and every near-death experience is different, you know, and it's, it's, it's different to that person. But it is one thing that is consistent, and it's about love and, uh, and that unifying uh, connection, which honestly, I'm still working on that here, you know, and that's what I realized. I'm like, wow, you know, I really, one-on-one -on -one getting something out is fine, but if I'm going to do this unifying love, I need to be with my brothers and sisters out here because this thing's huge, you know, and uh, it is about, um, you know, if it is a, a union of love and heaven, and what did Jesus say? Bring heaven to earth. He, he, he said it right out. Boom. Lord's prayer. Mm -hmm. Boom. Uh, then we would need more love here. So I, I think that telling someone to, to love or be better or whatever, it, it probably, I don't know if that probably might, that might not help, but like with you, if you can have them experience the love yeah. and experience the love within themselves, the love in nature, the love with other people and, um, and see themselves just for a moment, a little bit differently than what they've been told growing up or whoever said whatever about them and know there's so much more then it's like we're giving other people hope to be something more than they are because they are. I think that we can tap into their experiences of God too. And so yeah. I think that there are more people who are mystics. Mystic is, mystic is, a, is, a, is a word I'm trying to reclaim. I'm, I'm working on relanguaging and reclaiming language and historic language in particular. And oh, I um, love it. We need that. It's been lost. Translation education has been lost over the years uh, and people have forgotten uh, yeah, it's, I'm not talking about crystals and incense. I'm talking about I'm talking about divine mystical experience of the end of duality, or the the when, for instance, um, when a person has a visitation from a deceased loved one, and they shift from believing in the afterlife to knowing that this loved one is in the afterlife. They know, mm -hmm. and there's a telecommunication that occurs, and love. That's a mystical experience too, and so I want to tap into the variety of mystical experiences that so as many people as that there are in, in, the, in the world with near-death experience, there are more people who have had mystical experiences. They're just okay. afraid to talk about it. Uh, I agree because it's not popular. And I think it because it's not within that realm of uh, construct of religion that they're going to feel maybe like a heretic or something's wrong exactly. with them. And you can't deny experience. Nope. You, can't, you can't deny experience. And uh, you can tell when someone has an experience because there's an emotion attached to it, like it means something. You know? It's not like they're just telling their story. It's like, ugh. Uh, so you're absolutely right, which, uh, you know, that, what would you call that spiritually transformative experiences, out-of-body experiences? Mystical experience. Mystical. Is the, is, it's, the, it's the larger category. And, and mystical experience is not a subset of those things. Those are subsets of mystical experience. I, I totally agree with that. I totally agree. But I think mystical, you're right. And people think the occult and I think they don't really know what that means. And it's not an ugly word. So no. I, I would love, for, you know, for you to even do more and talk more about the whole, what a mystic is, what is, because then what, what people don't understand definitions. I've noticed that even in like readings, they're like, I, I'll have to say something two or three different ways. And they go, oh, because they have a button on a word because they don't really know what that word means. So I have to use another word and they go, oh yeah. Right. And I think that, that that word is misunderstood. So, uh, but, but to me, isn't it strongly connected to God? I mean, yeah. well, yeah, that's it. But people have a word, have trouble with God. I got a, I got a letter from a woman just this week, just this week. She's an Australian. She read my book. She loved my book. She was very upset. I used the word God. It pushed all her buttons. So she was mad at me for pushing her buttons not really mad at me for pushing her buttons, but saying that the, the, the church has been so, so terrible, I should never use the word God. Uh, it's like, uh, what's the word mean to you? It means oppression to you. 
to me, yes. it, it okay. means oneness of being and love. Um, and, you know, and I think that's what yeah. Jesus meant by it. <laughs> um, so I agree. Um, yeah. And that the church in general uh, misunderstands and misunderstood. And, and, and that's why mystics and the history of Christianity in particular were, were not really out in the general public. They were in monasteries and convents. I mean, they were, some, some of them were educated. So the, in a time period when few were educated, but um, even the uneducated ones were in monasteries and convents because they're a little dangerous in the general population. I, I agree. I agree with that. And, uh, and you got to think where we are right now is a perfect timing because people with all this um, havoc, mayhem, whatever the world is a little, you know, a little nutty right now, people are, I think that they are looking for answers and they're looking for, you know, what are things? And I think that they're going outside of what they know for that. Or the best answer is to look within. <laughs> there, there's your answer right there. But uh, but it's hard to look within if you have a bunch of stuff. So maybe we should say clearing away their stuff. But I do think that people are more receptive of these uh, mystical, spiritual experiences uh, because the fact is, I think a lot of people have had them. Yeah. They don't op and and they 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 don't know what to make of it. That's one thing, or they're afraid to talk about it. But I think that it's our it's our natural essence. It's who we are. We are spiritual. That's when people say, well, aren't, you know, aren't spirits frightening you? I'm like, no, I am a spirit. And I actually there had no body. Too. And they like me because I was hanging out with them. I mean, you know, they trust me, but we are spirit. Yep. What's the yep. difference? So, uh, ghosts are people too. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, ghosts are generally confused, but they're people. Right. People. They're people. They're, they're people. people. They just want to hang out here longer and you know, complain about stuff. But yeah, they're just people. I should let everybody know Peter Love, And I do counseling sessions one-on-one. Uh, -on -one and, um, you know, these two guys. Uh, but mostly not church. Not church on Sunday morning at uh, 9.30 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, and that's right now uh, 0500 uh, Green Minish, Green GMT. Green Mean Time, Greenwich Mean Time, Greenwich Mean Time. So, okay. So, the, so uh, your channel that would be uh, non-church. Not N O N T N O N O T. Not not N O T. Not church. This is the channel which they can subscribe, and that way they will get under my uh, name, under your name, Peter Panagor, that you will get uh, alerts to when you will have the next one, and then also your books that you can check. Hold them up one more time that they can get it in Amazon. And um, they can order them. And then, of course, you always are. Oh, that's beautiful. Fantastic. And um, just look, uh, you can also follow him as an author, uh, Peter Panagor, and also his site, what is it, peterpanagor.gov. So, which I love that. I'm like, well, that's, I love, instead of .com, .love is beautiful. So, look, thank you so much for your time today. I, I, I just love what you're doing. Um, you know, you're just uh, really an inspiration. Uh, you, you inspire me to be better. So thanks, thanks Tamara. Thank you. Thanks for having me, everybody. Thanks for you, Tamara. I'd love to talk to you again. We have more to talk yes, about, I'm yes, sure. Yes, we we well, do. Of course, of course. And I'll support you any way I can. Uh, and thank you so much for your time. And, uh, and uh, I, I love your message. Thanks. And if anybody want, has any questions, I'm sorry I have to run off, but we, we, we talked and talked. You could you know, let me know. Contact me and um, we can set something up. We can talk. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you have this information. All right. Take care and have a wonderful day.